Honestly, I regret making this already. Outriders is one of the most bland video games I've ever played in my life. Absolutely nothing about this game stands out from the crowd. Every mechanic feels either half-assed or stapled together from other games, and it just feels like a rushed, lazy mess. Say what you want about a guy who's not a huge fan of loot games reviewing a loot game, but I enjoyed Destiny 2. Now, I didn't play it after they made all these huge sweeping changes that basically ruined the game, so I mostly have fond memories of it. And I was ready to play another loot game, and if you saw, you know, part one or the rant video or whatever you want to call it, at the time of this review, pretty much none of those problems have been fixed except the server disconnects. So I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much, but just to remind everybody. That means performance issues, bizarre co-op decisions, having to return to lobby just to get the HUD on your screen, semi-frequent crashes, which is probably the most annoying one and other minor nagging issues like the lip sync not matching up or characters lines being cut early just stuff you would easily catch if you you know did any quality assurance on the game yeah that's st all still here so the reason i'm reviewing this is because you can't really review any loot game without touching the end game because that's the one part of this that is like destiny is that of course there's a co-op end game where you run through repetitive content for better loot. And so I'm gonna just split this review into parts. If you just wanna hear about gameplay mechanics, the story, or the end game, you can skip to these parts in the video. But before we get into this, do the things the algorithm likes. Liking, commenting, subscribe if you wanna see more. And if you wanna support me directly, check me out on Patreon. And without further ado, let's take one final look at Outriders. I have contained my rage for as long as possible, but I shall unleash my fury upon you like the crashing of a thousand waves! Be gone, vile man! Be gone from me! So let's start off with gameplay mechanics because this is the most important part of the game and also simultaneously why I think this game fails as both a looter and a shooter. Here's the thing with Outriders, and this is what's changed since my last video. I found out my ultimate problem with the game, other than the fact that I was correct, the Devastator is the worst class by a significant margin. All those people who said, oh, I can't believe you're struggling with tier six. Devastator's the worst class. It's bad. It's just actually a bad class. That being said, tier six is very doable if you understand one thing about this game. One thing. And it is the biggest issue. DPS is the only Thing that matters period there are no other builds it's only DPS well you might be wondering since I said in the last video if you die in two seconds how could you possibly be a DPS well simple there are multiple ways to heal yourself in this game and half of them just involve shooting so you don't even have to stop doing what you're doing to heal yourself and some classes even have healing abilities so this is another reason why Devastator is the worst, on top of survivability basically being useless, is that the Devastator could only heal by killing enemies in close range. So basically, unless you killed them in like three seconds, they kill you. Whereas the Pyromancer, which was the second class that I played, was much better, and it's not even the best class in the game. The Technomancer does like twice the damage of every other class but I'm not playing this game again just to see how broken it is. So I made do with the Pyromancer, which is a perfectly fine class. Miles better than the Devastator. All he has to do to heal himself is kill an enemy that's been marked by an ability, any ability, which includes volcanic rounds. See, three out of the four classes can enchant their bullets. Guess which one can't? The Devastator, yes. 
So, why is enchanting your bullets so good? One simple reason, other than just boosting damage, which is obvious, it ignores armor. Now, this is a mechanic the game doesn't tell you, but each world tier, how it makes the game more difficult, or at least the main way, is by giving enemies more armor, on top of doing more damage and having slightly more health. So, with one use of an ability, which lasts for an entire magazine, by the way, so LMGs are extremely good with Volcanic Grounds, for obvious reasons, you can completely ignore one of the main reasons that the game gets more difficult. And that's on top of inflicting burn, which ties into half of your other passive abilities. And one of your abilities can get mods to restore ammo in your magazine. This means all you have to do is activate that ability and shoot people for the entire game. Sure, you'll use your other abilities as soon as their cooldowns are over, but essentially all this leads to is holding down your right and left mouse buttons and occasionally pressing 1, 2, and 3 for the entire game. That's it. The game never gets more complex than that. In fact, a huge part of the game's problem, even though it sounded like a good idea for marketing, is that you don't take cover. Because you don't take cover, that's even less mechanics that you're using. You're just standing out in the open and killing enemies so fast that you get your health back before they can kill you. And that's as far as the game's complexity goes, truthfully. All of your other abilities, especially the cool looking ones, are completely useless. Because basically, your skill tree is split into three pathways. The top one, which is the best one objectively for every class, which is just making guns do more damage, and some abilities that basically also make guns do more damage indirectly, or make you get more health back by shooting people. A middle tree, which is survivability, which is the worst one for every class, even the tank, because survivability is pointless. Killing everything as fast as possible is the only way to play this game. And then the third tree, the bottom tree, makes your abilities do more damage, which from what research I've done, situationally, with extremely perfect gear combinations, is about as good as the top tree, even though you barely have to invest in anything to make the top tree good. So yeah, basically they did an extremely horrible job balancing their game, which I suppose shouldn't come as a surprise based on my thoughts of this game thus far in my other two videos. So yeah, how much better is the Pyromancer? Well, I reached tier six in the second level versus I think like the 11th or 12th level as Devastator. And eventually I even reached tier nine and I probably could have pushed till 10, but honestly it's not really worth the effort in the story mode because you'll get your best loot from the expeditions in the post game, which we'll get to later. Every world tier just makes the enemies stronger and that's it. There's no change in AI, there's no change in enemy spawns, there's no change in anything interesting at all. The AI is another lazy, highly questionable part of this game. I know this is fairly common in looter shooters, but man, am I tired of enemies that just walk straight towards you or just pop out of cover when you're not looking or, or can't even figure out how to get past a pillar between you and them. It reminds me of how I fought this one mini boss, where as a devastator, I basically couldn't kill him in any timely fashion because my damage was shit. So we basically just played peekaboo around this huge pillar for like three straight minutes. And the snipers especially straight up cheat. They actually have like a timed aimbot where if you stay in cover and they're targeting lasers not on you, if it's been a few seconds since they started aiming, if you pop out of cover for even a quarter of a second, they snap onto your head and shoot instantly. It looks horrible. It's straight up unfair, basically. It's just terrible design. Absolutely terrible. And speaking of terribly designed enemies, we have the monsters. The mindless monsters that you're going to fight a shit ton. These hordes of Final Fantasy monsters that basically run at you in a straight line and stab you. They have ones that can shoot poison shots flying dragonflies that shoot more poison shots, 
They have like these fat ones that can have little earthquakes. But for the vast majority of the time, they're literally rushing you in a straight line and meleeing you. While they're bullet sponges. The big ones, anyway, are definitely bullet sponges. Probably the most spongy in the game. Very, very obnoxious for obvious reasons. And it gets old so fast. Yet you fight them in so many areas. It is, it's just so boring. This is all not helped by the fact that every level is a series of straight lines with mid little arenas in between hallways. You know, call it an arena shooter if you want, which I don't think this qualifies. But a cover base shooter that is completely linear, no exploration whatsoever, is this genre's equivalent of a hallway shooter, which are bad for obvious reasons. I don't care how creative you got with your arenas, if that's all there is to the game, it gets old. I don't know why I have to explain this. I mean, sure, some people tolerate it just fine. I don't know how the hell you can tolerate this, but it just feels so mediocre and repetitive, man. And the areas with the monsters are basically the same thing, just take the cover away and make the ground completely flat so that you can't confuse the basic bitch AI. So yeah, all in all, an extremely mediocre experience when you combine these elements together. The only thing that this appeals to are loot goblins, basically. These addicts who need their fucking magical orange or gold drops to give them that little tiny dopamine hit. And I, I just, I get it on some level, but don't you need something, you know, a little more robust than this? You know, something fun going for it? This game isn't really even that fun to play. Even if you don't use cover, the majority of the time, unlike other cover-based shooters, you're still just shooting things in the head over and over again, and occasionally using a slightly flashy superpower. It's really just not that fun. So what about the loot itself in this looter shooter? As obviously that's one of the most important parts, especially for the people who actually would be interested in this game. Well, it's not bad. The actual loot drop rarities are divided in the same fashion that you've seen 10 other times before. Whites are commons, green uncommon, blue rare, purple epic, you know, orange legendary, right? And white and greens completely disappear from the loot pool once you reach max level. So really it's just blue, purple, and orange, and that's it. And the main difference between these rarities is the perk system. Now the perk system is simultaneously the best and worst part of the build system in this game. Some of the perks are really powerful, but some of them are terrible and you would never use them. And it strikes me as the type of mistake that would only be made if they didn't actually play their own game. For example, tier 1 perks are divided into a few types. There's ones that have an effect on your bullets. Like they cause bleeding, they restore health to you, inflict poison, or burning, or ash or freezing, which paralyze somebody for a few seconds. And then you have effects that activate on reload, which are terrible, objectively, because you never want to reload in this game. And they're basically the same things. Like, you gain a certain amount of health for every enemy you killed with that magazine when you reload. Or every enemy you damaged in that magazine gets frozen or set on fire or something. And then you have the tier 1 armor perks, which all of them improve one of your character's abilities. And there's like 3 to 5 for each ability. The problem is, once again, is that some are just objectively better than others. The best devastator ability, Golem, which essentially more than doubles your survivability, has a number of different tier 1 mods available for it. The problem is you've only got 5 slots, right, since there are 5 armor slots. So which sounds better to you? A golem perk that only inflicts bleed on enemies close to you every couple seconds, or a perk that doubles the duration of golem? Yeah, it's pretty obvious which one of those is way better. And it's like this for a lot of other abilities. And then we have the tier 2 perks. For weapons, roughly half of them are just improved versions 
of the bullet effects where they just have a smaller cooldown. Because normally there would be like an 8 second cooldown between freezing bullets or something. And the tier 2 version is 4 seconds. And then they also have a few unique damage over time effects like striking an enemy with lightning or wrapping them in chains. But it's essentially just the same effect with more damage. And so generally they're just a bit more interesting. As for armor abilities, they're completely unique. None of the tier 2 perks affect your core abilities like the tier 1 ones. And so you get some effects that are actually pretty powerful. A few of them dramatically increase your survivability on kill. Like one, you just kill someone while aiming down sights and it gives you a stackable defense buff. Which that alone gives you as much survivability as the middle skill tree for each class. So yeah, that's kind of, I guess, the little asterisk on the earlier section, is that survivability does matter, just not in the way you think. As in, it's not worth investing any skill points into, because you can just get armor perks that serve the same exact purpose, and there's diminishing returns after a certain point. So you just want to go max firepower, and then just throw on two or three survivability perks on your armor, and you're good to go. And then we have the tier 3 perks, and this is where it ties back into the main loot system. As I said before, basically the blues have one perk, right, a tier 1 perk. The purples have a tier 1 and tier 2 perk, and you can only change one of those perks. And then we have the legendaries, which have a tier 3 perk, one that's unique to each legendary. But also, this is where the main problem goes in. They made it so if you dismantle a legendary, you can put its unique perk on anything. And I'm guessing about half of you think that's awesome, and the other half of you think that's terrible. And I'm definitely in the terrible camp. Because it completely takes away from the uniqueness of legendaries. I mean, sure, legendary armor sets have passives on them, so that gives them a unique usage. But in terms of the guns... The tier 3 perk is the only unique thing about it. Well, that and the fact that it's locked into the gun variant that it is. Because just like, you know, some of these other loot games, there are gun variants within the gun types. So there's three different types of LMGs, each with a different rate of fire, damage, magazine size, etc. Right? And so, there are legendaries that just have a bad variant, and you can't change that. So it's better to just dismantle it and then slap that legendary perk on one of your epics and I could break it down further but all you need to know is that the loot is too flexible and it doesn't make the game play any differently at the end of the day you're still just shooting people in the head and gaining health back faster than you die and that doesn't change no matter what your build is that's all this game really is, standing out in the open, shooting people in the head, and popping your super abilities occasionally. And the gear chase is really all this game has going for it, which we'll get into in the end game section. But first, I want to break down just how bad this story is. That is one big pile of shit. Now, I already know what you're thinking. Who cares about the story in a loot game? Normally, I would agree with you. Except that Outriders has like 5 hours of cutscenes, so it's kind of hard unless you're just going to skip the cutscenes, which... Who the hell skips cutscenes on the first run through a game? Clearly, people can fly and by some extension Square Enix wanted you to care about the story in this game. So, let's take a look at how bad it is, frankly. I don't normally do this, but I think I'm just going to quickly just run you through the events of the game because I think they really speak for themselves. So our story starts with we're far in the future where of course Earth has depleted all of its resources, has broken out into countless wars, and the planet is basically falling apart. So of course they gather humanity's best and brightest and send them off on a ship into the stars charting for a planet that is obviously similar to our own, or at least has a sustainable atmosphere. And so fast forward X amount of years later, I can't remember if they actually say it, and who cares? They arrive on the planet, and they send the Outriders first, they're essentially the scouts, to go check out the planet to see if there's any danger before they send down the rest of the people to start building civilization again. And so the Outriders end up in this forest, 
and there's this weird mysterious disease virus thing and there's the anomaly this huge storm that vaporizes people and acts as an EMP so basically everybody dies except for a select few people and your character is infected and placed into cryo sleep until they can find a cure for the weird sludge shit so fast forward 30 years and finally you're woken up from cryo sleep to find out that humanity has gone to war with itself again and you've got to find out why so the people who let you out basically just left you behind and you're captured by the evil team we'll call them because basically they get very little development and the evil team sends you out to die in the no man's land which is essentially like trench warfare from world war one right which I guess makes sense because the EMPs have knocked out any aircraft. So we're stuck with a few tanks, which somehow still work. They don't really explain. And yeah, just fighting it out in trenches or a lot of conveniently placed waist high walls or sandbags. So you get struck by a storm and you're given one of four superpowers. Doesn't matter to the story which one you choose. As you start to escape the no man's land, you're stopped by another man with superpowers, or an altered as they call them, Seth, who realizes you're an outrider and spares your life. And then you're taken to the resistance? Or dictatorship? Uh, pff, they don't really explain it. And you meet your old buddy, Shira. And she's now the commander of the good guy army, I guess, in this area. And she is a bitch. In fact, Pretty much every woman in this game could be described as some derogatory term toward women because they are clearly the most insufferable of the species. Look, I got a war to win, so either you help me or you get back into cryo. You should have never woken up. So long, fuckers. I go to the end of the fucking world and you're still in my fucking face. <laughs> go drown in your bottle. Asshole. So the first thing you do upon arriving here is you break out your old buddy Jakob out of jail, who is the driver of the car. And he's the only good character, period, in the game. Only one with any development or complexity, or any charisma, either. Hey, do you remember my tunes I used to play? Like it was yesterday. I can still remember some of them. <clears throat> Please stop, Jakob. Please. I'm, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah, I'm just <laughs> And so you need to go out and use your superpowers to go defeat the other superpowered person on the evil team. That's your first mission. Uh, you go and do that, you reestablish like a radio tower or something. Then you meet Seth once again. And Seth really drives it home this time how altered are above the humans and you're essentially a god, so he has no idea why you're fighting for their cause and he's supposed to be the good guy among them if you haven't been able to tell by now this is a grim dark edgy worse than a 90s image comic type of tone so i guess this is as good a time as any to talk about the outrider himself because he is definitely not a blank slate while he is a very generic personality, he's still a person. He's not a self-insert character, so I'm not even sure why there's any character customization when he has his own voice, lines, motivation. He's basically just the Punisher, but slightly more of a good guy. He just gives off the whole, I've seen some shit, you know, type of personality, if you can call it a personality. Did you piss off? I don't need anyone else to babysit. I can take care of myself. <sighs> Not where we're going. So after you return from defeating the Altered, Shira tells you that the signal that you were detecting in the forest 30 years ago, which conveniently your character knows to write down the signal on his hand, I guess, it would just run with it, I suppose. That signal is still playing faintly in the distance and somehow that is the last hope for humanity. So first you journey to the first city, where you learn that the reason for the war is because when the Flores touched down, its nuclear engine was getting battered by the anomaly. And so essentially, if they didn't release all the extra people from their pods, they would have died. And the problem is, 
there wasn't nearly enough resources for everyone yet. They were supposed to stay in cryo until they could sustain the population. And so of course, because there wasn't enough food and water, etc, etc, to go around, huge war broke out, the first city gets irradiated by the engine, and slowly it turns into this hellhole over 30 years. So when you fight your way through, you know, another series of linear pathways, you find Dr. Zahidi, who basically, you know, is the tech guy, you can figure out all the signal crap, blah blah blah. And this sniper chick who was sent with you on the mission, there's a reason I didn't mention her before, gets shot in the throat immediately, <laughs> survives for like an hour, and then bleeds out finally. Completely pointless. Except to just shove down your throat how grim dark this universe is. And this is where a bunch of very vague happenings that don't matter happen for like the next five hours. You go to a snow place, you fight a giant volcano spider boss, which is probably the best part of the game, actually. Kill some bad guys, help some people on in some other areas. You meet Chana and Bailey, who work for this evil dude named Corrigan, who you have to temporarily ally with, of course. Turns out Chana is Jakob's adopted daughter, and she is a bitch to him for the rest of the game, basically. I get that they try to justify it with him being like a dick as a father or whatever, but he clearly cares about her and it's just, it's painful to see her be a bitch to him for 10 more hours? I mean, this game is really long, by the way. If you do all the side quests, the story is like over 30 hours. And Bailey is Corrigan's second-hand man who's basically keeping an eye on you. And so basically you make a deal with him to get Chana out of slavery. You decide to either, one, fight for him in the trenches, or two, go find Seth, as he agreed to fight. And so you go out to find Seth. Turns out, he died. After basically two conversations with him, he dies off-screen to Moloch, which is the big evil altered guy. So of course, now you have to take Seth's place on the war front, and you actually fight through a trench designed level for once. That is actually kind of cool looking. Too bad it only lasts about 10 minutes. And then you have your face off with Moloch, 1v1. You don't kill him. In fact, he gets away, and then you never see him again. I'm assuming he's like the end game final expedition boss or something at the time of recording this I have not beaten that so I don't know but he just drops out of the story at this point point. and so since you fulfilled your end of the deal you take Chana with you Bailey also goes with you I guess to guide you through the mines and so you journey through the mines and you finally come across the forest and you have to fight this super giant fucking monster bullet sponge guy you kill him, Bailey gets infected, and you come across this tribe of people who've been living in the forest for years. And turns out they found a cure, but you have to administer it daily. So you fight your way through the forest, and then Dr. Zahidi is taken captive by the other doctor guy. You break free this Native American guy, Tiago, and Tiago tells you about his friend who's been captured. And so you have to journey to this fort, you find out the doctor guy made the cure out of human bone marrow. So they've been killing all the other patrols that have ventured to the forest. And that's why no one's ever come back. Because they're churning all of their bones into the cure. Again, it's just like, why? Why are you trying to be as edgy as possible? I mean, it's, we get it. This is the most bleak future imaginable. Nihilism. It just gets tiring after a while, and cringy. What are you going to choose who lives and dies? I don't hide behind a basket of stones. When I kill a man, he knows it was me. And so you discover they actually have an alien, a native alien intelligent life captive. Name August? Not really, it's like August. August? Something like that. So they just call him August. And he speaks a little bit of English. And he's brutally tortured, of course. I mean, why though? Why did they torture him? I, they never explain it. I don't know. 
You break out of the fort, you continue on your journey to find the signal, since it's beyond the forest. And so, as you fight through some new areas, you find the rest of the aliens, and they're all psycho maniacs who shoot you, right? And apparently, according to August, it wasn't always this way. And so, of course, you wonder, well, what happened? Oh, and this isn't really important to the story, but, like, Bailey turned evil for, like, five minutes, and then she gets crippled. So the first big twist of the story is, it turns out, way past the forest, there are remnants of human civilization, but they're pretty much all dead now. So, of course, the characters are wondering, how is this possible? How do we not know about this? And you also find out through some notes that the Pax, as the aliens are called, used to all be peaceful and actually used to worship the humans. And yet, somehow they've all become monsters and you have to assume they killed all the humans. Well, it turns out there was a war between the humans and the aliens because the aliens had superpowers from the anomaly. And the humans wanted the superpowers, but they couldn't figure out how to get the superpowers. So, for whatever reason, this is the part that makes absolutely no sense. Because they couldn't figure out how to get the superpowers, they basically thought that the aliens were, like, gonna rise up and kill them all at any moment, despite worshipping the humans as gods. So, slowly, the general leader guy dictator who took over the humans just like started torturing, enslaving, and killing them all until the aliens had to use the anomaly to turn themselves into monsters to fight back. And eventually they won. And August is the only sane one left, which is never explained. But, of course, later on, he has to sacrifice himself to save Tiago because your character is nowhere to be seen. This happens twice in the story, because guess what? Jakob dies, they heavily foreshadow it, and, of course, the main character, despite literally being in the previous scene, leaves his best friend to die as he tries to save Chana by himself and, of course, makes a heroic sacrifice. And same with August, makes a heroic sacrifice to save Tiago. And then you have to put him down because he's a maniac. It's just so stupid. They just constantly kill characters that we're barely invested in to begin with. And it's just this terrible, like, cringy modern writing to try and seem, like, gritty and realistic. Except it's not realistic at all. I mean, sure, sometimes people die. Happens every day. But it doesn't make for a very good story if you're just randomly killing these characters that we barely know or care about to begin with. Just to prove the point that your universe is, like, super serial, guys. I'm super serial! Nobody will listen to me, but serial! <laughs> it's just bad. It's just bad, man. I don't understand why there's so many cutscenes in this game. And so the second big twist, finally at the end of the game, the huge revelation where this other human civilization came from. There was another ship, the Caravel, that never left Earth because it blew up because of some riots or something. And so they're thinking, how is this possible? Well... In the very last level, you meet the captain, Monroy, the general guy who took over everything and was a dictator. He's the last survivor, of course, just to hammer in more cliches. And he says that after the ship blew up, they took the time to build an even better space engine that was way faster than the Flores's. So they reached the planet an undisclosed amount of time, as far as I know before the Flores. And so they established all this stuff, and apparently the planet used to be beautiful, and then humans destroyed it again, because I guess we just learned nothing the first time. And so apparently Monroy alone is responsible for all this horrible shit, because nobody has a mind of their own, they only follow orders. Then they kill him. Chana kills him, like, immediately after that. So the source of the signal was the Caravel. It was broadcasting a distress signal this entire time. And so the plan is to use the ship's systems, which are still functional somehow, to send a message to the, like, Flores' parts in space that remained behind. I don't remember how they explained it exactly, but a piece of the ship is still in space that has leftover resources that they never drop down for some reason. So then you have your final boss battle against, like, the chief of the aliens 
who wants revenge and blah 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 and he's basically an altered but also an alien so he's even more powerful and you beat him so dr zahidi during the final boss battle is uploading these orders to the ship and of course it goes through at the last minute and the game ends with all these space pods raining down on the planet some people apparently followed your journey all the way here, somehow survived the hordes of monsters and, and evil humans and evil aliens with guns. And they're like, oh, you're the Outrider, we love you, blah, blah, blah. And so that's the setup for the post game, as now you need to go on expeditions to get all these resources and loot and stuff. And that's it. Story fucking sucks. I don't think I need to tell you that. What were they thinking, man? Why would you put this much budget into the story if you can't even write a half-decent story? It strikes me as the type of story that was written by a doomer. Where everything is horrible all the time, humans are always evil, will always do bad things to each other, even in the future, even on the brink of extinction, we are still killing each other. We enslave other races that are intelligent, and yet are still afraid of them despite being way more technologically advanced because they have ooh, little superpowers and everybody dies and nobody's really important and almost every side quest just further drives home how bleak and horrible everything is and people would literally work as a slave rather than fight in the war it's just so tiresome and it's immaturity masquerading as cynicism it's the type of people who browse Twitter all day and decide that everyone is evil and horrible except for their specific belief system. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that definitely seems like the type of people who wrote this story. Long story short, it's bad. And so finally we come to the end game. Is it worth grinding 30 hours through the story for the endless loot chase in the end? No, absolutely not. And you shouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, if you've been paying any amount of attention. What is arguably Destiny's biggest flaw, which is forcing people to play through the story to get to the actual quality content, is actually just this entire game. The post game does not up the quality of the content at all. In fact, do you know what the end game missions basically are? They're strikes from Destiny. Remember those? That's exactly what this is. Three players go into a mission and kill all the enemies, and that's it. There's like no unique bosses that I've seen anyway, which I'll get to in a second because I'm sure people are going to hop on this comment because yes, I'm sure the final CT15 expedition has a unique final boss or whatever, and that's the closest thing to a raid in this game. Well, I literally couldn't get to CT15. You want to know why? Because all of my character's items got erased. Yes, this is a known bug. They've addressed it. Apparently, they're going to roll out some kind of giveaway thing to replace all the lost items. But it literally happened to me the day before I started recording this part. So I can't even explore the rest of the end game. But I got to play enough expeditions that, honestly, I don't care. This game is so repetitive and boring. Just playing more of the same shit, but with two co-op partners, does not make the game any better. They even stole, like, some of the basic mechanics from, like, Destiny Strikes and Raids. Remember in Vault of Glass, where you just stand in the circle, and it opens the door, and you just gotta kill enemies while you guys stay in the circle? It, they did that in, like, at least two of the expeditions. So they can't even come up with unique mechanics, which really shouldn't surprise me. And also, this is where you get all the legendary armors, because eventually, once you get to a certain CT difficulty, as long as you beat the level under a certain time limit, yes, that's another thing, the end game is literally speedrunning. You can't make this shit up. You just gotta kill all the shit as fast as possible, which is exactly what I've been saying the rest of the gameplay loop is. So obviously they leaned into it further. I can't believe there's even a tank tree if l even the end game wants you to beat levels as fast as possible. And so, yeah, the, how much fun you'll have depends entirely on how addicted you are to just getting better loot. And also, if you're okay with playing with randoms or you've somehow brainwashed two of your friends to buy this mediocre-ass game. 
Not to mention, the co-op is extremely laggy. And it's because the crossplay, even though they fixed it, barely works. And so you'll literally get frozen for like 3 seconds and then be dead instantly. That exact thing happened to me. And the worst part is, I tried to disable crossplay and I couldn't find anybody. I guarantee you the majority of the people playing this game are playing it on Xbox because of Game Pass. That was something a bunch of comments told me, is the only reason they even tried this game is because it was free on Game Pass. And I can see why. Oh, and by the way, this is an important detail. There's no voice or text chat in game. None. Zero. You'll be communicating entirely through emotes. Not that this game really requires much teamwork, you basically just stand next to each other and shoot the same guy in the head, and that's the extent of the teamwork. And I wish I could expand on this section further, but there's really not much else to say. You're doing the exact same thing you did for the story mode, just with two co-op partners, and there's a speed running element. And yeah, it's just to chase your perfect loot build to do absolutely nothing with. And so, I don't even know if I really need to do a proper conclusion on this game. I think the gameplay speaks for itself. I've described everything in proper detail. The game is just extremely repetitive and mediocre and just doesn't have a satisfying gameplay loop. You need fun gameplay mechanics to sell a loot game, period. That's the only reason I spent like 500 hours in Destiny 2 is because the shooting was top notch. But this game is not fun, and that's it. That's the only thing that matters. And the story is so goddamn terrible. Which wouldn't matter if there wasn't 30 hours of single player content. Bare minimum, like 15 hours just to get through the story, ignoring all side quests. That is way too long. So yeah, long story short, game sucks. I'm so happy to not have to talk about this thing ever again. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Remember to do the things the algorithm likes, and thank you to all my patrons. Your support makes playing these terrible games a bit more bearable. And I think I'm definitely going to be talking about some actual good games for the next few weeks. I'm tired of playing terrible games. It's just depressing. I don't care if it makes a video more entertaining. It wears me down eventually. So I think next up is Resident Evil 5, most likely. Though I may make a video on an interesting new game. Haven't decided yet, so I won't really talk about it, but but yeah, the future is going to be bright for a bit, even if I'm just talking about the past. Because really, what is there anything interesting even coming out until Resident Evil 8? I don't know, maybe? Doesn't look like it to me. But I think Near Replicant is coming out soon, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know if I'll talk about it or not. And yeah, I'll just keep this one short, since I'm sure this video will have taken me a crazy amount of time to edit, so... See you next time, guys.